All right. Um, first of all, I'd like to say hello to everybody. Um, I'm very, 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 very happy to be doing this. I've been following the project all along and um, um, I've been watching um, Judy Herman's presentation and the two wonderful sessions that Jackie Linder did. And um, that and the fact that I know what amazing work you're doing and what difficulties you are doing the work in um, makes me really nervous today. Plus the fact that this is actually the first PowerPoint presentation that I'm doing. So I'm asking you to bear with me if there are any technical glitches and I'm sure Olena and Sophia will help me with that. Thanks again, Sophia, for the amazing translation work you're doing. We wouldn't be able to do this without you. So now I'm going to try and share the um, screen. There we go. Right, this looks good. So the short title of this presentation is Self-Care for Trauma Therapists. Obviously the long title would be for trauma therapists dealing with sexual assault in a war context. And as Jackie and Judy have shown these last lectures, that is something very different from, I find it hard to say that, from just rape. It's something very much more hurtful and needs to be looked at in a different way. Um, right now, oh yeah, okay. Right, this is just my name again, so you can um, read it. I am a clinician working in a hospital, basically with inpatient cases, but also outpatient work, doing psychiatric work and psychotherapy. And for these last few years, I've been doing more and more trauma work. Now, let's see, okay. There's a organization called the Consortium for Gender, Security and Human Rights located in Boston. And they do research, have been doing for quite a few years. And one of their researchers, Cheryl Benar, wrote a very interesting article in 1994, where she said that we are dealing with rape as a deliberate instrument of terror in the context of war. That means, oops, sorry, here we go. <laughs> um, that means that it is not something that happens, but it is a deed that is done with an intent, with an intent to create the maximum harm, the maximum damage at all possible. And you as therapists are or will be attempting to mitigate the impact of this damage. What I will trying to do in this webinar is to mitigate the impact that kind of work has on you. I will not be trying to show you more things that you have to do. It is not about 
doing more or learning new techniques, but it is about how you do what you do. And the aim is that you learn about self-care. And what I mean by self-care is an attitude of taking yourself seriously, of respecting yourself and of loving yourself. It takes specific knowledge to understand how to do that and how important it is to do that, but also the humility to know that we as therapists are just as vulnerable as those who we have taken upon to help. So it's about how you do what you do. It's about the mindset in which you do your work. And there's a few simple hypotheses to go with that. Whatever is good for our clients is also good for us. Whatever is good for us is also good for our clients. And that means what we offer our clients are things that we can also use on us and we as therapists, but also we as people have a very good feeling of what does us good, what helps us heal, what helps us out of sadness, what helps us out of hurt. And if we find out those things or have found out in our lives, then those are things that we can easily use also for our clients. So it's a lot about knowing yourself and knowing how you work, how your resilience works. And as people, our resilience works in the same way as our clients. The problem is when we support people who are in existential distress, we often find it difficult to take good care of ourselves. In the face of our clients' great need and distress, our own needs under the circumstances often do not seem so important. Sorry. But self-care is not a selfish concern but an indispensable prerequisite for being able to work with stressed people. So only if we ensure that we ourselves keep our strength up, can we really strengthen other people. Some general facts. As Jackie and Judith Herman said the lifetime prevalence of PTSD is much higher during war times than in peace times. The risk of PTSD generally is not so small following accidents or natural catast catastrophes, it's about 10%. Rape in general has a much higher risk of PTSD following the event, about 90%. Plus the risk of PTSD is even higher the younger the survivors are at the time of the event. Research has shown that right now about 30% are between 12 and 17 years, 20% are even younger, which is why it was so important to hear from Jackie Linder 
about what the specifics of children being raped are and how specifically to be able to help children. This lecture, however, is not only about children, but it's important to know that for them, the risk is even higher and the need for them to have good therapy is even bigger. As Judy Herman described, the highest risk factor is lack of support after the event or isolation. This is tricky because the survivors due to the shame involved with the event, with the rape, they have a tendency to self-isolate anyway. So with that and the possibility of isolation from outside, the situation becomes really, really dangerous. And one thing that's really important to do is do anything you can to promote a feeling of togetherness, of family, of neighborhood, of the village, the town, society, being there for the survivors, for the children, for the adults, for the survivors. Risk factors for developing PTSD is obviously isolation. Being isolated after being raped is the number one risk for developing PTSD. Obviously in the situation many Ukrainians find themselves with having to move, being displaced, not knowing where their family are, where their friends are, how they are, whether they're alive, losing all sense of security and of context. The risk of isolation in that situation is very, very large. Another big risk factor is phys the physical impact the rape has. That means if during the rape you've been threatened with your life, you've been frightened to die, or if afterwards you are dealing with wounds, with physical hurt, with injuries that need to be treated, that prolongs the event and um, maximizes the risk. Being female is a high risk factor. And as we said, young age. Previous childhood experiences are a risk factor. That means if by any chance you've had violence experiences in your childhood or attachment problems or mm, difficult trauma situations during your childhood, you are definitely more vulnerable to developing consequences of the rape. Another ris risk factor is if you haven't been expecting it. And obviously, rape is something nobody can expect, especially in a war context. However, we are being bombarded with images in the media. So maybe there is even some kind of a, um, a fear, anticipation of being a victim of 
the same kind of um, experience so that it may not be unexpected, but the fear level is a lot higher. Peritraumatic dissociation counts as a risk factor. Mm. It seems strange to even mention that because in the context of rape, you can assume that probably almost everybody will experience peritraumatic dis dissociation, which is life-saving in the situation, but brings problems later on. Another risk factor that needs to be mentioned is the social stigma that comes with the shame the survivor experiences herself or himself. Um, so negative reactions from the family very much increase the risk of developing PTSD. Lack of therapeutic options would be a risk factor. Um, you are trying to mitigate that danger, but obviously there are far too many victims, far too many survivors and far too few therapists. So that is how important it was to hear from Jackie Linder, how society can help and create structures and togetherness and provide opportunities for survivors, for children to move out of the trauma state. Protective factors, on the other hand, are certain elements of control during after the event, during or after the event. It's hard to imagine how what control would look like, but quite possibly along the way, there have been some choices. Um, for example, um, being able to get away and having been able to rescue somebody else. That's number two, having been able to help someone. I've heard interviews with um, children saying, young people saying, well, that way my little sister was able to get away. There's a situation like that in my own family um, my mother was one of um, seven sisters and one brother, and they were hiding at the end of the Second World War, and before they were able to flee, Russian soldiers came and some of the girls were able to get away and some weren't. My mother never actually said which of the three older sisters was not able to get away. But in our family, we have our suspicions and we think we know. So she was in that kind of a situation. And it always helped her to know that the little children were able to get away and be safe. Protective factors are social support from your friends, from family, from partner, from society in general, from neighbors, even 
strangers. It's important to know that there's a network of assistance and communication, experience of self-effectiveness are helpful and important. And if your personal values remain basically intact, that helps too. And obviously that is much easier if you're living in the context of a family or with friends. A perspective helps a lot. That is sometimes hard to generate, but any kind of perspective for the future helps. And obviously acceptance in society, not being isolated, not being stigmatized. Again, wartime rape is a deliberate attempt to create the greatest harm possible. It is a deliberate attempt at turning individual bodies of children, women and men into battlefields for the rest of their lives and for generations to come. This is why it's so difficult to get away from it because if you, your body, your soul are the battlefield, you're taking it with you. It is a strategic weapon aimed at destroying the social fabric of a nation. So it's not only personal, but it's aimed at destroying the context of a nation. And it is a crime against humanity and that needs to be documented. Part of the work you do is going to be about documenting it. This is the Consortium on Gender Security and Human Rights that I mentioned. And Cheryl Bernard in her essay in her work, researched the case of Bosnia. She was one of the first to methodically research rape as a method of war. And apart from other very interesting things, she identified four configurations what rape can be. It can be part of the deliberate assault strategy, which is what we're seeing in Ukraine. It can also be a signal of a breakdown of the command structure. It is also used as a formally forbidden, but de facto tolerated outlet or method of bonding for the soldiers. And in that it can also be utilized as bounty. Now the important thing is that we as therapists, when we talk about self-care, we need to name the perpetrators. We need to name rape as what it is. And in the context of war, it is essentially more than rape in peacetime. So one aspect of your self-care will be to contribute to name the perpetrator politically and individually. And in that, I hope that you in Ukraine are not alone, but that we also are contributing to naming the perpetrator as what it is. Uh, 
I'll get back to that a little bit later. Now there's some very first aid methods that you can use. And that would be obviously anything that signals community or belonging. That can be a blanket, a hot drink, a safe space or food. We know that first interventors after accidents or natural catastrophes have blankets with them and that's what they do. They wrap people in a, in a blanket. Research has shown that just holding a cup of hot drink brings down our anxiety level, our blood pressure, our heart frequency. A safe space means a safe, a safe space for the time being, just um, giving the survivor a feeling of, we're taking care of you, you're protected now, and food. Soaila Abdullali, who was born in Mumbai, survived gang rape at a young age in the 80s, has written a wonderful book called What We Talk About When We Talk About Rape. And in that book, she says, what's really important is to believe the survivors no matter what. So no matter how wild the story may seem, we believe them. And we ask them what they need. We don't have to guess, we can ask them. Something else that's important is we need to assure that medical issues are being taken care of. That means tending to the wounds, to the injuries, if there are any, and there will be. And it also means documenting. It may mean taking pictures, writing what we see, but for any kind of um, legal follow-up, this is essential. It needs to be documented either by you or by somebody from the medical profession. But if you are in contact with a survivor, you can take care that that happens and evidence doesn't get lost. Hopeful and a large group of researchers in 2007 tried to find out what principles should be used to guide and inform inter intervention at a very early stage. And they went through all kinds of um, empirical ev evidence and found five factors. That's a sense of safety, calming, a sense of self efficacy and community efficacy, efficacy. That means signaling that the group, the village, the structure, the hospital, the first aid center, that the survivor finds herself or himself is working. We're taking care of being there, of being efficient. Another factor is connectedness. So signaling, we're here. 
and hope. This will not be easy, but if there is some kind of glimpse into the future that can be positive and that you can transmit to the survivor, that is a very important factor. So these five points are generally considered consensus. Now I'd like to present a few examples. Um, I'm missing a word. How do you rescue somebody in a swamp? Is what it's supposed to see, say, in a swamp. So somebody's in a swamp and sinking and you want to rescue him or her. The first thing to do is you make sure that you yourself are safe. So you don't jump in because then there's only be going to be two people sinking. You stay where it's safe, you spread your weight, you use maybe a stick or a branch or a rope and reach out to whoever is in the process of sinking. So that way, both of you can be safe and move back into safety. Another example, is what do you do in quicksand? Quicksand can happen anywhere. Quicksand is what happens when some kind of terrain, earth, sand, clay, gets rained on or flooded. And when there is a lot of water, the formerly solid ground turns soft and liquid and oozes away. This happened a few, well, almost a year ago near Cologne, near where I live. And there was a flood and many parts of solid ground were so soaked with water that they turned liquid and engulfed cars and people and houses and everything. So this is really dangerous and it's important to know that any terrain with enough water raining on it or flooding it can turn into quicksand. As used as a symbol, this means any person with a terrible trauma with such as rape can develop post-traumatic symptoms. Just like in the case of quicksand, it's always a good idea to bring a friend But if you're alone, what you do is you drop everything you're carrying, you free your feet. If you're wearing shoes, you try and get out of your shoes. You try and be as mobile as possible. And you don't run ahead, but you try and move back. You try and take a few steps back. You try and lie flat on your back, maybe even make a few swimming motions backwards. Used as a symbol, that would mean don't rush in, don't insist on doing therapy right away, but lie back first, relax first, and think about what what needs to be done as a therapist. And important is whatever you do, be slow. May sound strange if you're dealing with emergencies, but you need to be so slow 
that you can feel in control of the therapeutic of the first intervention situation. So be slow, relax, trust the buoyancy of your body in the case of quicksand, in the case of therapy, trust the resilience of the survivor and of yourself. Breathe, breathe deeply, especially breathe out deeply and take breaks. Don't get into fighting modus all the time, but take breaks. In the case of quicksand, you need to take breaks in order to be able to check for incoming tides, for floods. You need to be watchful if there are further risks. And also, as in the case of rescuing somebody from a swamp, if there's anything you can use, like a stick or a mm, piece of wood, a board, a rope, use whatever you can. And what I said before, your documentation is a vital service, not only for survivors, but also for your society. You need to document what you're experiencing and you need to report it, write it down, even briefly, generically, if you can with the exact time. Make sure medical documentation has taken place. Test for injuries, treat injuries, and test for DNA if you can. Um, there are so-called rape kits that you can order from the, like from the Red Cross with everything you need in order to document as much as you can. And in the case of not being in the medical profession, but as a psychotherapist, take notes of what you observe. So what you see in the situation, what you see the survivor doing, how he or she reacts to noise, to a door slamming, describe the facial expression, describe the vocabulary, describe whether or not she or he can make eye contact, um, describe anything that you can observe. Um, I say this in, in quotation marks, objectively. You can't be objective in this kind of a situation, of course, but anything you can observe from outside, try and take notes. It has several positive effects. One is it allows you as a therapist to withdraw from the battlefield for a bit and be an observer. Being an observer means you are less inside the situation, but you're observing. So it allows you to switch from total compassion to a compassionate metaposition, observing. And it enables you to feel a sense of purpose, of a mission, because it is an important mission. So in that way, your documentation not only helps the survivor and your society, but it also helps you to keep your feet on the ground. Now, this is something that I'm presenting as a slide, but we don't need to go into detail. I just like to mention that there's trauma type one, 
which means accidents, plane crashes, catastrophic events in nature, um, catastrophic health issues like having a heart attack. Um, it can also mean crime uh, in any way. So in that um, assault, gunfire, rape. And then there's trauma type two, which means basically interpersonal trauma, but with less possibility or no possibility to escape. So anything that means you are imprisoned, you're being held down, um, you're being, for example, held in a, in a camp, rape camp or concentration camp, um, many, many kinds of war experiences, anything you might imagine can mean you are not in a position to escape. And those experiences lead to more severe consequences, lead to complex trauma or something called enduring personality change after cat catastrophic events. The problem is that there is a diagnostic dilemma. That means the system of diagnostic codes is not really up to date. Complex trauma was actually first used by Professor Herman in 1992. And since then, people have been fighting for that diagnosis, which is quite real, to be included into the system of codes, but so far it hasn't happened. Just one reason more why we really need to describe what has happened, but there is hope. The fact that there is a trauma diagnosis is not so difficult to spot and it is quite easy to document. The important thing is the event, life-threatening event needs to be named. Some people call it the A criterion. Apart from that, you need to be mindful in personal contact and you check the criteria. So actually we're talking about diagnostics made simple. These are the criteria. The A criterion means the event. And that can be any, any event that has life-threatening qualities that the survivor has experienced herself or himself or witnessed or even news about a life-threatening event happening to family members, partners, close friends. And the reaction is important in the situation. We talk about helplessness, despair or terror. So if those are present, then the A criterion is present and you can go on to see what about the other criteria. I'd like to name three important ones. Criterion B is dissociation. So that would be any change of consciousness or of attention, could be amnesia, could be numbing, could be conversion, could be depersonalization, could be derealization, could be flashbacks, nightmares, 
or any other kind of intense physiological reaction. Criterion C is avoidance of anything to do with the trauma. Could be quite obvious or maybe not so easy to spot. Maybe some smells, some mm, certain sounds, mm, feelings, sensory, sensory perceptions um, that are in any way related to the trauma and that in the consequence later on are being avoided. That should make us watchful and make us think of there having been a trauma. Um, this is important because sometimes you are dealing with people right after the trauma and then of course you know what had ha what has happened but sometimes you are dealing with people who are coming with maybe a depression or maybe fears phobias um maybe just conflicts on a personal level and then you need to know what to look for. And if there's specific avoidance of certain situations, that should be kind of a wake up call for you that there might be trauma in the background. And it's a good idea to ask for anything that might have happened in that way. Criterion D is negative emotions in any way. Could be fear, guilt, especially shame, a negative self-image, negative cognitions. That would be something like, it's my fault, it's all my fault. Um, I didn't do what I should have done. Some other negative emotions could be negative expectations, a very bleak and dark idea of what the future might bring, depression, apathy or distancing. It's important to realize that everything we call a symptom is in actual fact an attempted solution and in the catastrophic situation itself, it makes absolute total sense. And often it's what saves a survivor's life. For example, going into an immobile state, freezing, might be just what helps the survivor to be able to hide and not be found, or to prevent worse from happening. But when the danger is past, precisely that way of behaving becomes an impediment. And the problem is that as war continues, a high level of danger and of threat is maintained and it is very difficult to come out of the traumatic state because you see and hear and feel that the trauma situation, the danger is still present and is still continuing. I just put this in to assist in the documenting. If you're past the first aid stage, you might want to use some of the tests that are around. 
but we don't have to go in, in the, into this in, in any great detail. I'd like to continue with some more first aid stuff. So the very first aid um, methods we talked about before. When some kind of calming has happened, maybe some kind of regular daily life has been reinstalled. There still can be flashbacks um, and hyperarousal and depersonalization, derealization. And in order to get out of these kind of dissociative states, you could use for example, intense smells. Now there's a problem with that because you have to find out together with a survivor which smell works because it has to be a smell that doesn't trigger the event. You could use a hot taste, could be toothpaste or pepper, wasabi. You could use something cold or something very warm, or maybe a seashell, a stone, a pine cone. That could be something that survivors can carry around with them in their pockets and, and use anytime they find they're moving out of their bodies, out of themselves. You could also use some kind of soft pain, like a rubber band that you flick and something that doesn't need any anything to um, do the first aid with is anything you do with your body, like standing up, changing your position. If you're feeling some kind of dissociation coming on while you're sitting, stand up, walk around, stomp your feet, throw a ball, stand on one foot. And this is just first aid in order to reduce the stress enough to be able to focus on what is important right now. So those techniques won't make the pain disappear, but they'll help manage the memory. You could also use cognitive tasks like counting backward in 13s from 1000 or Mm, naming all kinds of animals or cities or foods with A and B and C. You can do balance exercises or you could prepare paper slips with difficult math problems or with meals and then you go through the ingredients to think of how you're going to cook them and the paper slip a survivor could carry around with them. And if you're advanced enough that um, your mind is not drifting towards the terrible memories all the time, you can try music, you can try relaxation exercises. The easiest and um, if most effective relaxation exercise is actually breathing, breathing out and in for a short time, out for a longer time. Jackie showed us how two days ago. Something like yoga um, with a few setbacks. Yoga tends to put us into strange positions, which might, might be mindful of um, the rape situation. So maybe something like Tai Chi would be more effective. The, the main thing is you're moving while you're doing your Tai Chi exercise. So relaxation in movement is better because it doesn't leave your mind free to drift back to the traumatic experience. 
What also helps is recalling positive memories. You might want to uh, suggest um, writing them down so that you can take them out of your pocket whenever you need them. Or this is something you can develop inside therapy, imagining a positive and absolutely totally safe imaginary place, like a garden, an island, a castle. Sometimes you need to have to go to outer space and imagine a planet because if the feeling is there is no place on earth that is safe, then maybe there's a planet or a fairy tale place. And like I said, in a state of hyper arousal or dissociation, physical exercise, active skills work better than being immobile. And this might be something to help survivors with. Mm, they can work out whatever works for them in low level stress, in medium level stress and high level stress. Part of the work being to help them identify what is low level, medium level, high level stress. So through trying to identify that, they get into a meta position, which always helps managing overwhelm. Something that's really helpful is bilateral stimulation in any shape and size. So any form of bilateral stimulation would be helpful. There's a very ancient tradition to that. Any shamanistic rituals, um, dance, Zen meditation, when you're talking about walking meditation, utilizes bilateral stimulation. Jackie Linder talked about drumming, which is part of many, many shaman traditions. So right, left of the hand um, of the drumsticks is bilateral. The butterfly stimulation, tapping alternately right and left is bilateral with the plus that you kind of get confused which of your hands is doing what. Bilateral stimulation, lots of people use instinctively when they run or stomp when they're flooded by emotions or pacing nervously up and down. When you find a patient doing that, um, it's a good idea to notice it and to say, wow, you discovered bilateral stimulation on your own and then to go on and explain what it is. So the alternation between the right and the left brain hemisphere promotes healing. And it's being used in many methods, just to name a few, EMDR, tapping, drumming in a group, knitting with both hands being used, meditative dance, which is being used in many, many clinics that service trauma survivors. And there's a huge scene um, for that. So many, many methods use dance. Um, let's see, maybe we should take a break right now. Before we do, I would like to ask if there's any questions at that point. Колеги, якщо у вас є якісь питання, будь ласка, ви можете їх написати в чат, і Катерина перекладе їх та передасть на бель. I just said that if our participants have any question, they could write them on chat, and our translator Katya will tap you on your personal chat. But now we have no questions. Okay. Okay, so we could ma uh, make a break, uh, maybe for 15 minutes, and after that we, uh, we, we, could, we will be able to continue. Okay? Right, okay. okay. So you. in the break, there's going to be some music from Ukraine. 
um, music that I like. And um, I would like to point out that some of the music that you're going to hear um, has been, ha has had a strong effect in creating community much larger than Ukraine, even larger than Europe. I'm talking about the European Song Contest with um, the winning song from Ukraine this year. And there has been a huge um, effect on the world through that song. And I have the feeling that many countries in Europe are moving closer together and closer to Ukraine. Also through that. Right, I don't know what you all did in the break. Um, I did some dancing <laughs> and um, I'm still nervous, but um, dancing helped. And maybe that's a good example of what music and dancing can, can do. It helps bring us down to a more relaxed state. And by the way, I think Ukraine should have won last year already, the European Song Contest. Um, I know two people in my family who are big fans of Katerina Pavlenko. That's me and my little niece of seven years old. She loved her performance. <laughs> okay, so back to the lecture. Very, very important message, whatever you do, don't do it alone. Well, this is an example of somebody trying to climb up a steep stone face of a mountain. Um, and quite obviously, whoever it is wouldn't be able to do it alone. So it takes two people. One takes care of security and the other might be doing some more risky things. But in any case, it takes two to be safe, and that goes for therapy as well. Of course, not in a one-on-one in -on -one situation, then you're still two of you with the survivor and yourself, but be aware that you need colleagues, you need people, you need a network to um, talk about what you're doing. And I think at this point, I would like to introduce what um, I and Jackie Linder and a colleague of mine that I'm going to introduce you to have been doing for the last few years. Jackie Linder and I have been in this um, group for 10 years and my dear colleague, Stephanie Geiring, joined, I think, two years ago, and it's called the Conference Call, belongs to the concept of Trauma Recovery Group, which is something Judy Herman and others developed in order to treat trauma survivors in a group, which is quite a risky business to do because before that, as far as I know, most people have said, oh no, you can't do trauma work in a group because then everybody would be talking about their trauma and triggering everybody else in the group. So lots of people suggested, no, don't do it, do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis, don't do it in a group. This trauma recovery group that Professor Herman and others, others developed is quite a stroke of genius because they do goal work. They work on goals, they work on things they aren't able to do in their lives at this point. And they talk about why and how um, trauma is keeping them from doing what they want to do in their lives. 
I remember one person who um, found that she wasn't able to go swimming because she was so ashamed of her body. And she only talked about how it felt for her to want to go swimming and what she thought about when she tried to get ready for swimming, tried to wear her bathing suit, and then she imagined what it would be like when everybody saw her. Quite obviously, this is linked to a very shameful experience that she had. She had been raped. And obviously, the other women in the group who had also experienced interpersonal violence I'm not quite sure if all of them had also had rape experiences, but many of them. So they knew what she was talking about when she said, well, this is because in the past, I've had a situation where my body was what made me suffer. And ever since I've been ashamed of my body. So she just she talks about her trauma in just little pieces and the others understand. And we as people who present the group are basically only presenters. And the real therapeutic work is being done by the survivors themselves. And the way we learned to do that group is there's a manual, which I'm going to show you later on, but also there's a supervision group going on, which works in exactly the same way as the trauma recovery group works. And about that, I would like to talk to my colleague, Stephanie Geiring, and I would ask her to unmute herself so that we can hear her. Right now, we can't hear you. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Hi, Stephanie. I'm Stephanie. Um, Annabelle and I, we work closely together at a hospital in Cologne. And a couple of years ago, I started training as a trauma therapist. And luckily, Annabelle invited me to join the conference call. And um, I must say, I, I love it. Um, well, I think the actual intention is to, to improve the quality of our work and to support our own mental health, which is super important, of course. But I, I think it, it has so many other aspects as well. Um, well, first of all, during the pandemic, we were quite isolated in Germany. We had pretty strict rules and it helped to, to lift the feeling of isolation and get in touch with people and talk about the, the way the situation affects you. And then I find everybody um, on that call very inspiring. Um, most people are more experienced than me as trauma therapists, like Annabelle or Jackie, for example. And they always come up with new ideas how to, how to support people and how to empower victims. And that is one of the major goals of my work as well. And um, I, I find it um, so interesting and so supportive in, in so many ways that it's, uh, it's hard to put it into a few words even. Stephanie, may I, may I ask you about timekeeping on our conference calls? I mean, we, we, um, we're on the phone, six to 10 people of us um, are all on the phone, not a video conference. This is very, very old fashioned. Um, and there's something very important that we do and that people in the trauma recovery group do too, and that is timekeeping. Yeah. Would you uh, I guess we'd be, that? yeah, I think we'd be lost without timekeeping. At the start of each session, everybody is asked whether they have an issue or a topic. Um, then, there, then a list is being made usually by, I think by Judy herself or Emily. And then the, the time is divided up based on an estimate of how much each topping is going to, to take. It can be 10 minutes, can be 20 minutes. Um, and the time is kept rather strictly. There's some, 
some allowance for a few minutes, but um, I think it's about giving time and space to everyone. Uh, and, and so, so no, no, no topic is going to, to be dropped. Even if you're the last one on the list, you know that your topic is going to come up and that there is going to be enough time to discuss it. So everybody feels um, seen and appreciated. I think we'd be totally lost without the timekeeping yeah. because we'd, we'd keep discussing issues, come up with new ideas and new aspects. And I, I think we could spend hours on, on the topics we have sometimes, but it, it doesn't take us anywhere. So it's, it's very efficient the way we're doing it. And it, w what I really like about it is um, that um, it's totally open to whatever we want to talk about in the context of trauma. It could be tr trauma in, in the context of patients we're treating, but it could also be trauma that we ourselves are experiencing at work or politically. Um, and the, um, this conference call gives us enormous support. And yes, sometimes yeah. um, it's, it's enough to just take two minutes to mention, I just want to give you a quick update on my activism work on women's rights, or I just want to give you a 10 minute update on the group I'm doing. Um, so it doesn't really, it, it's not really important to have a lot of time but it's important that anybody who wants can have some time yep. and can say how much time. I think that's really great. Yeah, it is. And also what I, what I really like about it is um, that it's so, it, it gives us a sense of international connectedness. Jackie Linder in Canada and um, Judy Herman in Boston and Rosa Bramble in New York and a few colleagues in Germany. So it's across the ocean um, and a huge sense of connectedness. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks for asking, Annabelle. Good luck so to everyone. Go on with the lecture. This is just one one example of um, it, it's well it's an ex, it's an example of what works for the survivors works for us therapists as well, and it's an example of it really helps to do things together, and things you do together you can you can do a lot more risky work because the structure is there, because the support is there, because the timekeeping is there. It allows for risky topics and um, gives you the feeling of being safe nonetheless. Now, let me find back to where I wanted to be. I wanted to show you something about mirror neurons. There they are. So mirror neurons are something that we have in our prefrontal cortex, in the Broca area, um, which is an area closely linked to speech. And what they do is they synchronize our behavior and our body language. The example in the picture is somebody yawns. And anybody who sees that will have a tendency to yawn as well. Or if you think of somebody feeding a small child, usually the person feeding the child will open their mouth and the effect of the small child will be to open their mouths as well. So that's one effect of mirror neurons, how they work. And from a very early age, 
from the beginning, actually, they enable imitation of behavior. So what we can see is we can see people comforting each other. And we know, ah, oh, this is how it works. We see people hugging each other and we see, oh, this is how it works. They're also called spaghetti neurons because we see somebody eating spaghetti and we see how it's done. And that is how we learn how to eat spaghetti or anything else complicated. And there's evidence that mirror neurons are what enables empathy. Oops. These are some of the people who've been doing research. And one of the early one, earliest ones is a Mr. Giacomo Rizzolatti, who was born in Kiev. So he was one of the pioneers of mirror neurons and research on mirror neurons. And he found that in primates, monkeys, gorillas, I think it was, I'm not sure. Um, if one primate sees another reaching for a peanut, the areas in the brain of the primate that doesn't have a peanut are activated just the same as with the one that is reaching for the peanut. And as research went on, more people found out more information about mirror neurons. For example, Sophie Scott in London found out that sounds trigger emotions. And shortly oh, afterwards, ma. somebody found out that no. in PET scans, you can even measure the area you can you can actually see the area that is being activated. Hello, mom. Somebody hasn't muted themselves. Um. So they're the foundation of being being able to think and speak and be compassionate. And they seem to react only when what we see is familiar to us. So if there's some connection to what we've experienced before. So emotional contagions happens when we know the feeling. That means for us therapists that we are activated via our mirror neurons, especially when we know what it feels like to feel hurt or lost or shamed or in danger. So it's easy to imagine that if we as therapists are in a threatened situation, as you in Ukraine are often, we are bound to be more moved, more triggered even by what we hear our, our patients, our clients, our survivors that we work with telling us. That means we need to take extra care about how we treat ourselves well and how we take care of our safety. We rely on mirror neurons for our work. Without them, we wouldn't be able to work as therapists. And they work best when we can be in touch with our own experiences and feelings. But that is risky work. And the challenge is not becoming overwhelmed by what we hear. What is my mirror neurons? Your mirror neuron is what sits in the front of your brain and what enables you to see and feel 
what you are seeing in somebody else in a very direct way. You react directly. And the fact that we're documenting what we see and hear is what helps us maintain a meta position. So meta position, kind of an overview over what you are doing with the survivor, with the client. And while you're doing that, and at the same time in the situation, you watch for being well anchored in yourselves, to be stable, you watch how you feel, and if necessary, make any changes, and you try and keep that over you, overview. And being the guardians of safety in that therapeutic situation helps our clients, of course, and ourselves. It also helps ourselves. And if we feel safe, chances are our client is going to feel safe as well. To make sure of that, you can keep checking and double checking, asking your clients about their level of safety. But one important aspect is how safe do you feel yourself? Group therapy has a lot of positive aspects for survivors. Professor Herman talked about that a lot, but it's also very, very helpful for us as therapists. As Dr. Geiring said, it leaves us in the position of a presenter and that contributes to our safety. In emergency work, so-called environmental aspects are more important than trauma details. Um, that means um, environment being what contributes to safety or to danger? Um, what contributes to the survivor feeling safe, but also to the therapist feeling safe? So if you in therapy want to make sure you feel safe, check for those environmental aspects in the space that you're working in and ask less for trauma details. It doesn't make sense to go for the details because they destabilize the survivor and they destabilize yourself because they're hitting on your mirror neurons and triggering whatever you may be feeling as far as um, your own kinds of fears, your traumas, your experiences. Later on, at a, at a later stage of therapy, when you're actually deciding with the survivor to work through um, the trauma experience, that's when details might be important. But in any other situation, you're not the one that asks for details. If the client offers them, okay, you might still need to say, okay, are you sure this is a good, good idea to go into that detail again? Even that might be possible, but you're not going to be the one that's asking for details. Because as I said, the challenge for you as a therapist is not to become overwhelmed. What you do in stage one interventions is actually anything you would do for a friend. You make sure that there's a safe space that you're working in. You offer alliance. You say, I'm on your side. I believe you. I believe what you're saying, no matter what. You respect their boundaries but also your own boundaries. You validate perception. That means you hear what they're saying, how they're feeling, and you're saying, 
yes, I believe that is how you're feeling. Of course you're feeling like that. You acknowledge the trauma. You acknowledge that something terrible has happened and you say so. At the same time, you broaden the attention. You make sure that the perspective widens, maybe to things in the room, maybe to people surrounding the survivor, maybe to anything that might interest them and you support solutions, meaning you support those solutions that the survivor has already found for himself or herself. And very important, you give information. You give information of the kind that says, well, it's absolutely understandable that you're feeling this way because this is what happens in your body. This is what happens in your brain. This is how your body takes care of you. This is how your body tried to make sure you're safe and don't go into overload. That kind of information can be really, really helpful. In fact, today, this morning, I got a mail from a friend of mine who organizes um, workshops for therapists. And he wrote that I have not committed suicide like many traumatized people. He himself is heavily traumatized and he went into this work of organizing seminars as a result of his having been traumatized. It's a fascinating life story. Um, he went to see all kinds of therapists, listened to their, listened to their um, seminars, to their talks, to their lectures, followed courses, and decided he wanted to record all that. So he made a living of recording lectures. This is way before Zoom or anything of the kind existed. He made... Um, cassette recordings and video recordings and made those accessible for anybody else. And he said, like many traumatized people, one of the reasons that I did not c commit suicide, even in times of deepest despair was, I knew about the physiological and psychological mechanisms of my depression at every stage of my crash. The depressive crash was accompanied by an inner observer. The only thing he could do, he, the inner observer could do was prevent the worst. And then he went on writing, if you ask people what they expect from suicide, you often hear words like peace and quiet. However, if you know even a little about the physiological and psychological patterns, you don't have to commit suicide to finally have peace and quiet. I often think when I hear about suicides, if only they had had more knowledge, they would still be with us. How senseless, what a loss. Peace and quiet can be found in life every now and then, and sometimes continuously. One does not have to die for it. So this is what my friend Bernd Ulrich wrote in German and I translated it because I wanted that to be in the presentation. I was, I thought it was very moving and very, very um, insightful, very wise. So give survivors the information what is happening in their bodies. Now, there is a young poet, 
poetess, I should say, Amanda Gorman, who rose to fame when she recited a long poem at the inauguration of Joe Biden in 2021. The poem was called The Hill We Climb. And I'm quoting from the poem. One small passage is, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. And this was at the height of the Black Lives Matter movement after the atrocious murders of people of color through policemen. Everybody could see it on TV, on the screen. And in that situation, she, as a person of color, made this, made this poem and this is the, the quote that I think is very, very impressive and fits our work really well. For there is, there is always light. We may not see it all the time, but it is always there. And sometimes it takes a lot of courage to see it. Looking past the trauma to see the light. And if only we're brave enough to be it. I don't know if I'm going too far. I don't think I'm going too far in saying that you as therapists in a way are light for some people. And you're planning to be light and it takes a lot of courage. That's for sure. So we're talking about what can help us to be brave, to be light, to find that kind of courage. And the term resilience is what helps us and what has helped many researchers over the last few years to find out what helps people to stay alive, to stay physically, psychologically safe, even in the face of great danger and traumatic experiences. And some people have founded a, a movement or a type of psychology that call themselves positive psychology. One of the protagonists is um, Seligman, and he researched worldwide to find out what resilience means. And there seem to be enduring qualities that signify that somebody is resilient. Um, how do we find those qualities? They remain stable over time and all kinds of dangerous situations in a society, a quality of um, resilience being present is celebrated in the society. People are being praised for it, or if it's not there, it's lamented. And those are qualities that parents often attempt to pass on to their children. In society, there are institutions and rituals for cultivating qualities of resilience. That could be early participation in festivals of music or dance. Um, could be religious, religious practice, could be games, could be debate clubs. I remember um, traveling to uh, Riga in Latvia um, visited a, a music festival with 14,000 people on stage performing and dancing. 
and their culture means from a very, very early age, from the time children can walk, they participate in dance groups and music groups. It's part of the culture. From what I've heard that exists in Ukraine as well. Um, resilience is passed on by role models. Some people are especially resilient. And like I said, it's recognized across all kinds of different cultures. And those, those qualities are um, that have been found in, in all kinds of cultures, wisdom, under the heading of wisdom, um, you might think of good judgment, curiosity, creativity, love of learning. Then there's courage, not necessarily bravery, but also enthusiasm, authenticity, like in Amanda Gorman's poem, if you're brave enough to see it, to be it. Then there's humanity, things like compassion, friendliness, social intelli intelligence. Then there's justice, could be leadership qualities, could be fairness, could be um, love of cooperating. And there's temperance, which means good qualities of self-regulation or readiness to forgive caution or being unpretentious and there's transcendence, capacity for gratitude, for hope, for spirituality. Now the important thing is you're not expected to have all those qualities but it's totally sufficient if you can identify one in yourself. So for example, you think of yourself as somebody who is really good at cooperating with others. Then one thing you would do in order to improve your, or to strengthen your resilience, you would do lots of stuff that helps you live out that quality of cooperation. Your aim would not be to try at developing all those other qualities because if you if that's not your strong side you would be setting yourself up for disappointment but you go with that quality that you know you have and you feed that you seek occasions to cooperate you um make yourself feel really, really strong in that quality. I'd like to remind you of what I said in the beginning. When we support people in existential distress, we often find it difficult to take care of ourselves. Our own needs and circumstances often do not seem so important. But self-care is not a selfish concern, but an indispensable prerequisite for being able to work with stressed people. Only if we ensure that we ourselves keep our strength up, can we strengthen other people. So what can, what, the question is, what can we do to strengthen ourselves? Because if we don't, our mirror neurons are going to soak up all those feelings of stress and fear and sadness and pain and anger, and they're going to be part of what we are feeling at the moment. And this kind of reaction is so fast that it's, it's much fast, faster than any process of transference and counter, counter transference could be. The mirror neuron system is obviously at the base of 
what we call transference and countertransference. But our reaction to somebody who's in distress is immediate. We know how that feels. I know from watching the news and seeing what goes on in your country. I know I've spent evenings watching and just with the tears running down my face. I know it really happens spontaneously, just like that. And what you, what you experience as a therapist, if you're in that situation and don't know what to do about it, is compassion stress. And if it goes on too long, compassion exhaustion. So at the end, you find it, you may find it hard to be compassionate even. It's one kind of secondary traumatization among helpers. I've worked with first interventors among police and, um, and um, firemen and um, first interventors in, in the medical field for a long time. And they say that sometimes those reactions are very, very strong. A lot of them said, especially when it's about children, they react very strongly. That means if there is a strong connection to their own life experience, to our own life experience, especially when we or our family or friends aren't safe, or if our inner images of what we hear and see are very strong and they resonate. And typical symptoms in helpers could be just as in PTSD, flashbacks, reliving the stories, reliving the images, nightmares, and avoidance. So the tendency to avoid certain situations, which would be fatal if it led you to stop being able to be a therapist because you're in a state of compassion exhaustion. And of course, hyperarousal. Your physical reactions of tension, of restlessness, of anxiety, of sleeplessness, um, all that problems concentrating, um, all that could make it very hard to continue your work. So those might be alarm symptoms. If you notice that you can't sleep anymore, well, then you know there's something you need to change about how you do your work. You might need more breaks. You might need to change something about the setup. I'm going to talk about that a little later. Um, this is something I mentioned before so leave it to the clients to speak or be silent. You're not going to be the one to ask for details. It can do people good to confide in somebody about what they have experienced. But talking about traumatic experiences can also be stressful and overwhelming for them, but also for you. So it really make, makes sense not to ask for the details. What you can do is really important. You witness and document what you see and hear. You acknowledge the horror of the experience. You listen as respectfully as you possibly can. You observe what is not being said, and you ask what they need. Asking for what they need is a lot easier than asking for details. And as in the image with the swamp, 
or with the quicksand, go slowly, do anything slowly and be responsible for your own safety. Stay on safe ground and only continue for as long as you do not feel overwhelmed. And if you do sense physical reactions of overwhelm, take a break. And it makes sense even for the clients, for the survivors you're working with to know that you are taking care of your own injuries of how you feel, how you are able to tolerate what you're experiencing because that way they don't need to worry about you. So you want to be aware of what you want to do and what you don't want to do in your support work. What you can give wholeheartedly and where your limits lie. Time limits, thematic li limits. Maybe this is determined by other responsibilities, by your job description. Maybe you have to go and limit it yourself individually in your volunteer work or in your therapy. And if you communicate clearly and respectfully to the survivor, to the client, about what your tasks are and what they're not, that contributes to safety for both of you. And be aware when somebody crosses your boundaries and allow yourself to set boundaries. For example, if you know that the concern of the survivor is valid, but it exceeds your personal cap capabilities at that moment, then setting boundaries doesn't have to be hurtful, but it's a matter of safety. In the example of trauma recovery group, setting time limits is part of creating safety and it becomes part of the ritual in the trauma recovery group and in our own conference call for the supervision. So survivors, trauma survivors, participants of that group get to know timekeeping as a ritual that serves their own safety. And you can use that same method in creating safety for yourself. Some examples, you set a time, you take conscious breaks, you use rituals for closing the computer, shutting up the work space, um, take a short walk, um, use the, the distance it takes from your workspace to your um, home to clean up your brain. So you use that as a cleanup distance, or you can take a minute to review the day before you're actually heading out. You can do some breathing exercises if you like before leaving work. You can do visualization like setting down the load, like carrying a heavy backpack. And then at the end of the hike, at the end of the day, at the end of the therapy session, you set down the load or the heavy suitcase, you put it down and you feel lighter and you feel how light you feel and active you feel. You could use symbols like wearing a badge, a name badge that you leave at the hospital or a special pen that you use to document the traumatic stories that you can leave at the space. And those are all messages to your unconscious that allow you to discard your professional setup. <laughs> and do anything you know that makes you feel good. 
You need rest, but you also need activities that do you good. Like during the break, when I danced, and I know Olena said she was also dancing, maybe some of you did too. So if you know dancing makes you feel good, dance. And if you know singing, singing in a group makes you feel good, do it. Or listen to music. Listening to music we love releases oxytocin, which is a very powerful hormone that um, does us good and makes us feel connected and relaxed. Some people like to do exercises. Exercise is great because it burns stress hormones running. It releases endorphins. It enables neuroplasticity. These are relatively new findings that even old brains grow new neurons provided they have enough oxygen and they have, have enough stimulate, growth stimulating hormone and growth stimulating hormone gets produced when we move our muscles. So saying we should get our butt off the chair means yes, we should move our gluteus maximus because that sends growth hormone up to our brain and enables new neurons, new connections. Any kind of dance helps, pets help. So many people made sure they, when they had to flee from their village in Ukraine, made sure they had they took their cat with them, their dog with them. Um, I know one story of, of a lady who fled to Ireland and she was devastated that she had to leave her cat. But the first interventors that helped her get to Ireland actually found the cat and brought it to her in Ireland. And of course, that was another one of those mo moments. But um, it was really, really important for her to heal psychologically. You could meditate, you could meet friends, you could spend time with family, no matter what, anything that makes you feel good, do it and make time for it. I remember in Judy Herman's um, lecture, somebody asked about the role of media. Um, it's a difficult question of what to do about media because knowing what's happening, of course, is something that increases safety, but the way media report may decrease a sense of safety if what they're showing is being shown for marketing reasons and not for, for information purpose. And one problem of continuously watching the news is that every hour on the hour you see the same news or you listen to the same news and the feeling you get, not only children, but adults too, the feeling you get is that it happens every hour over and over again. Your poor brain can't really tell the difference. For your brain, the perception is it happens every hour. Every time you watch the news, it happens all over again. So this is something you will have to balance for yourself, um, whether it makes you feel safe knowing what's going on or whether it leads to greater psychological stress, seeing it all the time. Um, I think media should be educated that they play an important role in enhancing safety or threat and I think in these last few months, um, serious media have come to 
realize their important role. But also you might want to encourage survivors to limit their ex exposure to news or you yourself might decide to limit your exposure. And you should definitely avoid media with graphic um, photographic material. And definitely you should seek or accept support. So offer groups in pairs, do webinars, exchange with others as much as you can, create intervision among yourselves, check in with professional organizations, and use your social networks for feedback about your work. This is important, pool resources. Not everybody has to invent the wheel by himself or herself. Pool whatever you have as far as media material and use supervision, doesn't matter whether live or online. For me, the TRG group model is excellent. I tried to convince you of that. And you might want to co cooperate with um, specialized counseling centers. Networking is part of what that is. Professional organizations, some of them I'd like to present. There's the ISTSS, um, International, um, oh, help me, Jackie. <laughs> International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. Exactly, right, thank you. <laughs> Um, they take care of um, advancement and, and exchange of knowledge about traumatic studies, but also are um, quite active in promoting um, traumatic, post-traumatic um, care, therapy, and knowledge. Um, in areas where resources are scarce. For example, there was a big project in Rwanda after the terrible genocide that had gone on there. Um, and they have put together lots of material specifically for the Ukraine situation. So if you go on that link, you can find lots and lots of lectures of ideas, of protocols, of contacts. Um, I would highly recommend you um, check that out and take a look at it. They have a plan to um, further research excellence and clinical excellence. They want to be a diverse and politically engaged organization. So they promote professional demographic, cultural and geographic diversity and inclusivity among the members and create opportunities for um, therapists, for people working in that field. They do aim at a global impact, increasing the health and resilience of people and communities. Um, they also try to prevent um, traumatic stress as a response to war, say. Um, they promote innovation and have put up um, several prizes for people um, doing innovative work 
To tell you the truth, I think your group should apply for one of those prizes. And if you go on the homepage, you can check out um, what the criteria are. Because I, I really think that the work you're doing is um, unique and something I've never experienced in that um, shape and size. And um, I think you deserve international recognition for what you're doing. The ESTSS is the European little sister of the ISTSS. And they too have um, specific material available. They have um, links for connecting. Um, and um, they have sort of the same goals. They meet in a European um, city every two years. I think this year they meet in Belfast and I was thinking that maybe the next time we could meet in Kiev or Odessa. <laughs> Be a nice idea. The Consortium on Gender Security and Human Rights located in Boston is um, the home of Cheryl Bernard, whose article I quoted earlier. And it has their link if you want to be in contact with them. These are some more links that I wanted to offer. ISTSS is um, what I had mentioned. There's also a site called Women in War, which also brings together scholars and activists from all over the world, including war zones, uh, especially interested in uh, exploring all aspects of gender conflict and armed conflict. They do online seminars, publications, conferences, and counseling. It's a very interesting um, site. And the last two are um, sites in inside Germany. I am not sure whether there are any participants actually practicing in Germany right now. But as you're all going to have the slides, I just put them on there so they're there for you to see. And I wanted to present a few books. Um, this is a manual from uh, Professor Judith Herman and others. Um, including members of the Victims of Violence program. So you have survivors and scientists, practitioners, clinicians who work together to put up this um, manual for group trauma treatment in early recovery. Excellent manual. And this is what we work on when we do the trauma recovery group. Very readable very easily um, understood. I don't think there's a translation in Ukrainian, but it is so readable that um, I would um, suggest you try anyway. Maybe Sophia mm, would like to make a translation. I'm sure that would be very appreciated but that's just an idea. <laughs> then I would like to mention this book, Trauma and Recovery from Judith Herman. Um, the subtitle says from domestic abuse to political terror. So she covers the political dimension of trauma as well and focuses on recovery, which is very important. The first edition was 1992, but there are several 
um, new ones. I don't know the newest one, but um, oh yeah, maybe 2015. This is one of my favorites by a specialist called Bessel van der Kolk. The body keeps the score. It's about the physical aspects as well as the psychological in healing and the transformation of trauma. So obviously it des he describes what happens in the body and what happens in the body as it heals and how we can help bodies to heal. Excellent book. And this is what I had mentioned by survivor uh, Suhaila Abdulali, what we talk about when we talk about rape. Excellent book. Also very, um, I wanted to say readable. It's not entertaining to read it, of course, but it's easily understood. Um, this is something else I would like to mention. Um, Steve Haynes has a whole series of books. Depression is really strange, but this is trauma is really strange. Um, that works well for survivors, for your clients. Might be something you might, you might offer them to read. As well as this book, which is quite new. Um, the subtitle is Arriving and Surviving in Germany. Title is Victoria. It's not so much about Germany, but it's about surviving trauma. But as it is first published in Germany, it's also, it contains a part of a, um, part of it is self-help. But that has been translated in all kinds of languages, German, English, French, Italian, Ukrainian. So that might be useful. Now, this is another quotation from the young poet Amanda Gorman. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. Sorry. <laughs> that even as we, as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. And that even as we tired, we tried. This goes out to you. So are there any questions that I might attempt to answer? Yeah, the cruising in us. Okay. Do you have any questions, Jacob? Yes, I um Annabelle, can you speak a little bit about the virtual dancing group um that you have found so helpful and talked about? Um I love talking about that. <laughs> and um there Actually, many, many groups exist in the meantime. Um, maybe I should begin by saying that um, one of my main resources um, is dancing in any way possible, but also circle dancing. And um, circle dancing has become very important for 
many trauma therapists, but it's also fun, of course. And it's a way of feeling connected. It's a way of exercising your mirror neurons because of course, when you're dancing in a circle, you see opposite of you, somebody else who's experiencing similar feelings as what you're feeling right and left, you're in contact with people, with hands. And through the um, corona pandemic, we haven't had the occasion, we haven't had opportunities to be in contact, to touch people. So there haven't been any dance circles, but a few of, of us presenters of dance circles have gone online with them. And the amazing thing is that if I see a presenter showing how a dance works. For example, um, to the song that we played in the in the intermission, um, Zelene Gito. There's a wonderful circle dance to that music. And say, for example, the presenter shows the steps, and then I see a whole screen full of people doing the steps and I do them in my living room by myself alone, but it still feels as if I were doing them with the others because I can see them on screen. I can see the movements and I can imagine, I can remember what it felt like dancing with somebody. So this is something many, many participants say that it's so amazing how connected you can feel even via a screen. Thank you. Я зараз попрошу нашого прикладача Софію приєднатися і Прикласти те, що я буду говорити для, наш, для усіх вас. Uh, I'm just asking, I'm just said that I want to, um, uh, I ask our translator, Sofia, to translate all my words. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk in Ukrainian. And, and now it's very important for me. Дорога Анабель, я вам особисто і від імені взагалі проєкту, і учасників, і організаторів проєкту, я вам дуже вдячна. So dear Annabelle, me personally and uh, me uh, as a part of the project and me, and me as a representative of all of our participants, I am really grateful to you for your presentation. І те, що сталося сьогодні, ця атака, а, і всі а, події, які неможливо було проконтролювати, говорить про те, що ми дійсно робимо хорошу справу, а, і те, що кожен день Україна бореться із іншою думкою. And uh, all that have happened today, including uh, the attack and all of this unexpected events that happened during uh, your webinar, they really show and demonstrate that what we're doing is important and that Ukraine does uh, promote important calls. І я вдячна усім нашим учасникам, тому що завдячуючи вам, взяли ця лекція відбулася. Дякую вам за ваші питання і взагалі за будь-яку підтримку. Ми це робимо не лише для себе, ми це робимо дійсно для підтримання вищого рівня психотерапії в Україні. And I'm also extremely thankful to all of our participants because our lecture today happened only thanks to you and it remained thanks to you. And this, uh, these webinars, this project, we're organizing it for the best of the psychotherapy in Ukraine. And today's lecture finished our project. It's beautiful, but it's sad. And our today's lecture was actually the final one, uh, the lecture that is ending our project, which is both beautiful and a little bit sad. 
І я сподіваюся, що ми ще зустрінемося з вами, Анабель, з вами Жаклін Ліндер у, у наступних проектах. Я впевнена, що вони будуть. Thank you so much. Thank you for this unbelievable, unbelievable and awesome support. It's very important for Ukraine. I thank, thank you. you for the unbelievable and awesome experience of being with you and of experiencing the wonderful work you do. And um, yeah, thank you so I only hope you can be safe and continue your work. Сподіваюся, що після війни ми обов'язково зустрінемося з вами у мирній Україні і побіваємось, поговоримо і повчимося. I truly hope that after the war we will meet together with you in the free independent Ukraine and we will be able to speak and to hug each other and to be together. Thank you. That would be so great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.